Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Unzan Chitta. Don't despise a beginner, said I. If you are a seeker of supreme enlightenment, you should know that the lowest class may have the sharpest wit, while the highest may be in want of intelligence. If you slight others, you commit a very great sin. I thought that was really important uh, because we fall into that trap quite a bit ourselves. Now, historically, uh, as I said, the Winung Sixth Patriarch came from the South, meaning like Guangdong, somewhere down there. And they were uh, looked askance by the ruling class, by uh, monks, anyone who wasn't from down there, apparently. So he was a little kid. His father had died. He and his mother were living in poverty, and he was doing what he could uh, to help support the family by selling wood, chopping wood, selling it, you know, whoever might need it as they walked by on the street, he'd be there for them. And at one point, it said that he heard uh, one of his customers chanting the Diamond Sutra. And as he says, uh, upon hearing it, he was immediately awakened. We'll see through the course of the Platform Sutra a number of times when uh, Winung is uh, awakened. Uh, probably one of the most well-known sections of the Platform Sutra is the uh, Battle of the Gathas. The uh, fifth patriarch, Ongren uh, said to his students, to the monks, that they should compose a gatha. And from that, he'd be able to see what their understanding was, how much uh, they had to go before realizing the essence of mind. Bodhidharma called it uh, true nature. It's the it that we're all looking for, even though it's not an it. <clears throat> so, uh, Shen Zhu was the chief uh, monk, chief student of the fifth patriarch. And he uh, took it upon himself to write a gatha. And he had a lot of consternation about it because he was like, well, if it's not that good, then he'll see I'm not so far along in my practice. But if it is good, that'll just be a big ego stroke. And all of the other uh, monks there decided, well, he's going to get the uh, robe and bowl anyway. So we're not even going to bother. So they just assumed that Shen Zhu was going to write the Gatha and in turn be given the uh, title of sixth patriarch. So anyway, his Gatha goes like this. Our body is the Bodhi tree and our mind a mirror bright. Carefully we wipe them hour by hour and let no dust a light. Now, I don't know if it rhymed in Chinese or not, but, you know, we'll go with it. <laughs> so, uh, I always found that odd that they had to make it rhyme in the translation. So, uh, all the other students, they see this thing written on the wall and it's like, wow, this is great. This, he nailed it, man. And uh, Winung comes by at some point or another. He's heard about this and 
he asks one of the uh, passers-by to read it to him because Hui Dong was illiterate. Yet another reason for people to look down upon him. So he had it read to him and he gave it some thought and um, he wasn't uh, entirely satisfied with it. So he asked uh, this passerby uh, to write down his on the wall. So he composed a gatha also. His goes, there is no Bodhi tree, nor stand of a mirror bright. Since all is void, where can dust alight? Now, the fifth patriarch had already seen Shenju's verse and he praised it. He said, yeah, you guys, learn it, chant it. You'll get a lot of merit. He met with Shenju privately at their interview and he said, you know, you really haven't realize the essence of mind. You've come up to the door, you're like right here, but you haven't gone past that. And Shenju was, was disappointed, of course, and, um, you know, he did what he had to do. He continued his practice and he surfaces uh, much later in another circumstance, but that'll be a subject for some other talk. So, Winong, the rice pounder, the illiterate rice pounder from the South, the barbarian, uh, is summoned to um, Hong Ren's quarters uh, late one night. And Hongren Holt, you know, he hangs up the, the robe to shield uh, them from anyone who might walk by. And he says to Huinang, I give you my robe and bowl, as in, you're the sixth patriarch, you have the understanding. Now, <clears throat> What's interesting is we all sort of assume that, yeah, he nailed it. We can quote this thing and we'll be good to go and see our essence of mind. Uh, Johnson, are you ready with the, uh, the graphic? Oh, not yet, man, not yet. <laughs> That's okay. Um, it's okay. So anyway, there is this tendency we have to um, put celebrities, sports figures, religious figures, whomever they might be, patriarchs of Zen, on a pedestal. Like, they've got it, they nailed it, and there's no two ways about it. Anything they say, we can take at face value as it. Sung San uh, went to uh, the Six Patriarchs Temple, and um, you know everybody was admiring the Gatha and all of that. And, uh, okay, Johnson, hit it. So this is an excerpt from uh, Wanting Enlightenment is a Big Mistake. As the abbot of Liu Rong Temple, Zen Master Song San and his students looked at the poem on the wall in the Hall of the Sixth Patriarch. Dai San Sanim said, with this poem, Huineng was recognized and became the sixth patriarch. But there's a mistake in this poem. You were the abbot of this temple. Do you see the sixth patriarch's mistake? 
Visibly shocked, the abbot gestured at the poem. A mistake? The sixth patriarch? I could not imagine. On which line? No, no, Sugsad replied. Not these lines. The lines are correct. The characters are all correct. But the meaning is a big mistake. If you say originally nothing, that's already a big mistake. Because if you truly believe there's originally nothing, you cannot even write or say originally nothing. The sixth patriarch said originally nothing, which means that there is something that says originally nothing. That makes everything. That's the first mistake. Also, the sixth patriarch has made three dusts. Originally nothing dust, Bodhi dust, and clear mirror has no stand dust. How can you say in the last line, where could dust remain? There are already many, many dusts in this poem. That's a contradiction. So the whole poem is a big mistake. Then looking at the abbot whose eyes remained widened with shock, Daisansanim said, how would you correct this poem? The abbot replied, well, when the sixth patriarch wrote originally nothing, he was referring to the phrase in the Diamond Sutra, all formations are impermanent. If you view all appearance as non-appearance, you can see true nature. That's what the sixth patriarch meant. Daisansanim said, yes, that is the principle of emptiness. The head monk wrote about form is emptiness, emptiness is form, meaning Shen Ju. The sixth patriarch's poem shows no form, no emptiness. In other words, the head monk is attached to the impermanent of the familiar, uh, phenomenal world, whereas the sixth patriarch is attached to emptiness. That all makes sense intellectually, but the true world is form is form, emptiness is emptiness. Would you please hit the sixth patriarch's poem from the point of view of form is form, emptiness is emptiness? The abbot said, oh, in that reality, opening the mouth is already a big mistake. Then how can you open your mouth even to say that? The abbot covered his mouth with his, with his hands and said, oh yes, I made a mistake. And the reason I, I put the compass of Zen graphic up there is because we can see where in the, the wheel of practice, Sung San thought that Shen Chiu was it at and what, uh, how many degrees of practice the sixth patriarch was at. And okay, you can bring that back down, Johnson. Thank you for sharing that. It's great to have audio visual aids when doing one of these. So don't despise a beginner. 90 degrees, 180, 270, and zero and 360. There's a lot of times when I think we expect ourselves, although certainly not anyone else, that we'll walk into the meditation hall, sit on the cushion, and be fully fledged, fully formed, fully flowered to the point where we're not attached to form, we're not attached attached to emptiness, we're not attached to form as emptiness, we're not attached to emptiness as form, none of it. We're there already just because we sat on a cushion. And my friends, it doesn't work that way. If you learn an instrument, as I said a few weeks ago, you practice. You don't start off great, but you get there. With meditation, with Zen practice in general, you don't generally sit down and have it already. That's why we call it a practice. We need to work 
on ourselves. We need to observe our essence of mind, our true nature, and get to the point where we're comfortable with the idea of, and we're also comfortable with the idea of talking when it's appropriate too. But don't despise the beginner. The beginner may have something that the wizened old codger doesn't and vice versa. <laughs>